All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, glad you guys stuck around towards the end. Literally the last talk before we have the have the final uh, final panel. I'm going to be talking about obviously some mobile hacking, iOS, Android. Um, I'll be talking about some of the goals uh, with regards to pen testing, taking apart apps for both platforms, as well as hybrid applications. And we'll talk about just generally um, the definitions of hybrid, native, and things like that. But first, uh, my name is Aaron Guzman. I am based in Los Angeles. I'm a pen tester. I work for uh, SecureWorks. I am a board member for OWASP Los Angeles and um, also the president of Cloud Security Alliance Southern California. So if you guys are ever in the area, we have monthly meetings um, literally every month. And we hold, uh, if you guys are in California for, uh, let's say, January, we have our App Set California right on the beach, Santa Monica. So if you guys are in the East Coast, anywhere with snowing, come to the beach, West Coast, always great. Uh, great talks. We have, you know, Sammy Campcar and Charlie Miller, I think those type of stunt hacker guys. Uh, but aside from that, uh, enough about me. Again, this is some of the things, Android fundamentals, iOS. Um, I'm going to go through some demos and some tools I'm going to introduce. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you guys can at least do 70% of an assessment. And the perspective we're going we're gonna to go off of is more of um, a pen testing perspective where you get an application rather than acquiring it from a third party or things like that. Um, so there's three, three open source tools that I'm going to demo, uh, all free, all on GitHub. And um, you guys can grab those, and then we'll get some, some questions, fit those in. So half of it will be kind of talking, half of it will be demo. So um, hopefully you guys can... We can see what's going on, on the screen, but um, so with with Android, uh, most most everybody probably knows it's based off of Java. Uh, it's not your regular Java uh, type of applications. Um, it's a specific version for uh, Android, and um, the reason being is um, the regular Java, like with JSP web applications, things like that. You have a Java a JVM, and which is a virtual machine where things are compiled, things like that on runtime. So Android, you have a Dalvik VM and the new Android runtime uh, VM. And the main concepts for Android are uh, activities, intents, services, broadcast receivers, and content providers. And activities are basically just the screens you see uh, when you open up an app. Uh, intents are basically do actions behind the scenes. Um, so I have an activity. Uh, I want to do it. I want to perform some sort of action. I'll have the intent do that action. And a broadcast receiver can be something like a notification service. And content provider could be like a SQLite database or sharing that to a third party or delegating that to uh, another app within the same developer. Um, and just the general um, review process of Android applications are, are different than they are in iOS. And we'll go to iOS in just a second. But uh, for Android applications, you submit them to uh, the Google Play Store. And with Google Play Store, you have um, the Google Bouncer. And the Bouncer just checks for malware activity, puts them in a sandbox, basic type of checks, backdoors, things like that. Nothing as strict as, um, as Apple, like I said, we'll get to in a bit. But uh, it's kind of just low-hanging fruit type of testing. Nothing sophisticated. Um, a lot of research projects to say from like master thesis of, of universities will kind of end up in a Google Bouncer uh, uh, like practically. Um, so here's the, the basic like form of, of an Android like kind of configuration file, um, which would be the Android manifest. And this is where the permissions are set. These is what, this is where uh, the activities, the services, uh, the intents, broadcast receivers, everything I discussed in the previous slide is all right here in this XML file. And when you take apart an app, the first thing you'll see um, uh, I'll, I'll go through kind of taking apart an app as well. You'll see um, a series of, of XML files, just key value pairs you can see here as an example. Uh, sometimes you'll find uh, clear text passwords. You'll find um, secret codes as in you press 1357 on your phone, something will prompt up, things like that. So this is usually like step one where you want to look at within uh, an Android application. But again, this is where... All the permissions are set, all the uh, content providers and things like that. And again, the content provider would be, I want to give someone access to my database or my application sandbox, put it that way, which doesn't sound safe, right? So 
So iOS, iOS is based off of uh, Objective-C primarily and also Swift, but what it is is basically a messaging uh, language. So it's like, hey, you want to pass me, you want to tell me to do something? Okay, let me pass it over to um, on runtime to this what's called uh, Object-C message send. It just sends everything through here. So if you have GDB, if you have uh, any other type of debugger and you just hook for object, Objective um, uh, message send, you'll get everything that's getting sent over to the kernel and back and forth. So uh, with Swift, is, is the same right now. It's, uh, you don't have to, uh, you can build them um, with Objective-C and Swift as far as applications together. And uh, iOS, the same thing at Android, they created, uh, like Google's created Android classes um, for their uh, Android framework. And same thing with iOS to like, for touch screen, uh, we'll go through it in just a second, but you have touch screen media, uh, and things like that, um, that our, uh, Apple exposes their APIs to. So you'll have public APIs, private APIs, and that's also within the Apple review process. Uh, any application that gets submitted to uh, the Apple pay, uh, Play Store, Play Store, I'm sorry, Apple, the App Store, sorry, um, will go through a series of checks more stringent than the Google Bouncer. So. Uh, one thing would be if an application is using a private uh, API for Objective-C, it'll get denied right away. If it's using an old open SSL library, it'll get denied right away. Uh, obviously, if it has some sort of backdoor, some sort of malware activity, get denied right away. If it's using um, a vulnerable framework, which will get into frameworks as well, get denied. It's much more, more strict. They'll go and send out notifications to all um, application developers, let's say, or owners, if there's a big um, vulnerability, say OpenSSL or even uh, another framework, bolts or things like that. So again, again layers is, is what, what Apple does. So Cocoa Touch is touchscreen, all input. Media would be speakers, things like that. Core services would be like iCloud, for example. And um, Core OS is, is all the kernel level uh, based off uh, BSD, things like that, and uh, they give you a, a when, app, when the application runs within uh, within an uh, iDevice, would be uh, iPad, um, iPhone, you'll, it runs in a sandbox. And this is during runtime, you'll have a sandbox here where uh, you have your main app, your container, and you'll have a documents, which is kind of where the SQLite databases lie. You'll have your library your temp directory, your library will have your cache information, and you have your iCloud container. But when you take apart, um, when you get an actual binary of uh, an iOS application, it's an IPA file. So .IPA, and all it is is just a zip file, same thing for, um, for Android, they're APK files. Just rename it to, uh, from, from app.apk, app.ipa, so I'm going from Android and iOS to uh, app.zip for both. And all you gotta do is extract that, and uh, when, once you extract that for, um, for IPA files, this is the structure. It'll automatically create a payload directory, and within the payload directory, there is um, the application name, which would be over here, application name.app. And you'd wanna go into that directory, and there's a binary of the raw, uh, the raw binary for the application. So that's what you would get, drop into IDA, for example, you could see all the classes, all the functions. So it's not that difficult. Uh, it's not impossible at all. It takes just as fast as it, as it does for um, Android applications to take them apart, look at the code, uh, and we'll go through that right now in just a sec. So equivalent to Android's X, uh, um, manifest, Android Manifest X, XML, uh, iOS applications have what's called info.plist. And again, it's the same thing. It's an XML um, key value pair. This is how it looks within Xcode, and uh, it just creates the XML file for you. But it's the location where uh, you have, say you're asking for certain permissions, you'll actually write a description to Apple why you want these permissions. And um, same thing, plenty of times, time and time again, I always see passwords in here, or let's say Blowfish encryption, uh, secret keys, private keys. Um, you'll see some interesting information. So this is, again, the first step uh, that you'll want to look, or, or first file you want to take a look at is the info.plist. And um, it's just, again, just a general configuration file that 
that the app looks at to see um, if the application has any kind of extensions. So when you, if anybody has any, uh, like an iDevice, an iOS phone, and you, you hold it, it opens up in Twitter or opens up in your photos or things like that, it's an application extension. So uh, that's something that's got created with, I think, after iOS 8. And it'll be defined here in the info.plist. So we'll go through just the building blocks of Android uh, framework. Now, I did forget to ask, has anybody researched mobile or pen test mobile applications? Cool, a couple people, three. Okay, how about um, web applications? It's usually the same, okay, cool. <laughs> cool, cool, anybody do it just for research general, curious, wanna learn a lot more, okay, cool. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through the, the, from the bottom up from the Android framework. What I do want to focus on is the difference between um, Android's kernel and a regular like Ubuntu uh, kernel. And what that is, is just what's called uh, the binder. And the binder is what uh, Android uses for inter process communication, IPC. It's basically like a proxy. So you have process A here, process B, proxy, uh, I'm sorry, binder. And uh, process A will talk to the binder, and binder will talk to process B, depending on permissions. And the kernel checks um, the permissions. The, the, I think it's the uh, the user ID and uh, group ID as well. So the, the kernel does a lot of the heavy lifting uh, for permissions and also uh, IPC, inter process communication. But that's kind of the whole takeaway from this. Uh, it's built in layers, obviously. You can see with uh, the libraries and Android framework here where we talked about providers and, and managers and, and things like that, as well as applications. Uh, another thing kind of to know is uh, with applications, you have system applications and you also have user applications. So system applications are the, are the ones you can't delete um, unless you're root. And uh, those are installed in like slash system apps. Um, but that's just, it's, it's not anything to do with security. But again, we talked about the runtime. Um, there's some native libraries, but they're not as important as just knowing the, the differences between uh, the kernel and obviously it's more, it's uh, Android's built more for embedded systems. And here is um, iOS type of architecture for uh, their devices. And I just want to just e explain or show that uh, the, 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 uh, the separation between hardware, software, and how the container as far as uh, you know, where your passwords are stored and keychain, it's stored in, in the secure enclave. Um, I'm sorry, secure element. Secure enclave is for touch ID, um, and you also have uh, your group keys, things like that. Your root certificate, which Apple obviously has. We had the whole San Bernardino cracking iPhone scenario recently, and um, your phone obviously. Well, after iOS 8, your phone is automatically uh, encrypted at rest. So. Uh, there's called data protection APIs, and those data protection APIs use these keys here uh, at the kernel level. So Apple's built that in by default for newer iOS devices and iOS versions. So we'll talk about native frameworks, I'm sorry, uh, hybrid frameworks, and what they basically are is you have iOS, and you have Android, and you have hybrid, which is basically web technologies that combines um, both iOS, a code base, and also Android, and uh, HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, and how that's exposed is via web views or in-app browsers, for example. And uh, just think about, you have not only native vulnerabilities, um, you have web vulnerabilities as well. So a lot of it is mostly JavaScript injection for uh, hybrid uh, vulnerabilities. And we'll go through the frameworks, the common frameworks and builders, and um, why you'd want to think about researching documentation and, and developer uh, disclaimers that these builders and uh, frameworks provide you. And just, just, it's ridiculous. We'll go through them right now as far as the, um, the example. So again, it's like web app-ish. You have uh, client-side heavy JavaScript, uh, a lot of doing a lot of the heavy base work. <laughs> Everything is going JavaScript nowadays, client-side. You have Node.js, you have Angular. Um, and again, one code base. So uh, you can have Android and iOS update and update without even redeploying. It's all web, so it's like a web, web app. 
Uh, there's no submitting to the Google Play Store. There's no submitting to the App Store. There's not, there's not a review process. Uh, once you submit and get accepted, you can do whatever you want as far as a hybrid application is concerned. So they can have uh, vulnerable APIs and still get away with it. So something, a big key takeaway here is uh, you don't have to redeploy with the hybrid app, the native app you do, which uh, two days for the app store and like a day for a play store. And again, native, uh, Objective-C, Swift, the native language C, C++, uh, generally better security only because you have more control, control over the code and, and functions and, and what you can do with it. With frameworks and hybrid, it's mostly just frameworks. You have someone who's already pre-written code, templated out, and um, it's almost a building block. They're just building blocks. And we live in a time today where you can drag and drop and build not only web applications, but mobile applications. So it's very, very simple and um, cheap and fast. So with, with HTML5, you have, you have technologies like WebSockets, and you have to be careful when uh, you're testing for WebSockets, because the way you tether and the way you proxy for network API testing, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, as far as the only way I've gotten an iOS application and proxy and see WebSockets is if I do it via Bluetooth. If I do it via Wi-Fi, I can't see WebSockets. I'm not sure why, but uh, I was talking to guys from uh, Invisium, and they they share the same, the same headaches with WebSockets, but something to keep, keep in mind. Um, there's local storage. So not only do you have cache, temp, SQLite databases, but you also have local storage, which is persistent on disk. And um, a lot of tools, free tools out there, don't look for local storage. Uh, they just look for cookies, cache, databases, SQLite databases. And for iOS, there's something called Realm databases as well. Uh, you have to have a specific uh, application to view those, but uh, these are also just generally the attack surface that's expand from, from just native mobile apps to uh, hybrid. And WebRTC is a pretty cool technology, but it's also a huge risk. A lot of uh, unified communications applications use WebRTC. It basically just pierces uh, right through, or traverses your, your firewall, uh, and it uses almost like a reverse, reverse shell, rever not reverse shell, reverse call, so it can open up that port and send traffic through it peer to peer. So a lot of privacy concerns with WebRTC and file system API just by the sound of it. It's not great. <laughs> but um, another thing, is, which, which is pretty cool with HTML5, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of ASM.js. You can now like, compile applications like real time with JavaScript on a website. It's so, there's so much more to worry about. So, the main and, and probably most important uh, framework that people use or common framework is uh, Apache Cordova, which was uh, known as PhoneGap. And what these uh, Apache Cordova, a lot of other frameworks hop on the same bandwagon and use Cordova's type of technology, but they have, instead of using like a WebKit uh, uh, runtime, it'll use Crosswalk. And again, you'll have to update your, your runtime for web views, um, and you're relying on, on the crosswalk kind of code base, which is open source, community-based, uh, to be updated. So here's just some examples of, of advisors. I know you guys can't see, and it's not supposed to be, so you guys can read this. It's just to show you from last year to now how many uh, high and medium vulnerabilities have been disclosed uh, for Cordova. And I think there's three high uh, and four mediums here. So these are, um, some of them are, they're high if they are uh, like remote code execution or even uh, HTTP whitelist bypassing, which might be over here. I can't find it, we'll find it here. It is this one. So what that means is basically uh, JavaScript injection. Um, when you're with, with a Cordova application, you have an XML file, again, for a configuration file, right in the root of the application bundle or application directory sandbox. Uh, and you can also check for that too. There's, also, there's passwords in there sometimes. Um, but this is just to show you just within the year, you have seven 
uh, high and medium, remote code execution, uh, JavaScript injection, which is cross-site scripting, uh, which can also give you not only JavaScript code execution, but also Java objects within the application sandbox. Yeah, and this one specifically is with regards to uh, Android intent. So this is for Android and iOS, and there's more than this. This is just off of their uh, change log and their update page, uh, just searching for security, and there's, there's plenty, and there's still more to come. And you'll see right here that they have their own kind of package managing system, which we'll get to in a bit, but again, expanding that, that attack surface, which is actually right here. Uh, you can publish your own uh, plugins for Cordova, and what these plugins are, um, they give apps native access, basically. You can. But anybody can publish a plugin and anybody can use it. And it's based off of NPM. So if anybody was paying attention to the news lately with regards to NPM and how some guy kind of rage quit, took off his, his 17 lines of code and, and broke every build, um, think about how you can just use your own plugin that is not reviewed, by the way, by anybody. You can just pull it down, install it, any developer is going to use it. Uh, and then essentially just use, name it something like calendar.js, whatever, and make it, you know, probably legitimate, and then put a couple lines of code that are not. You do plenty with it, but the point is you have your own packaging managing system, uh, no code review process, anybody can do it, you can use it. Uh, it's all dynamic, all during runtime. And um, it even tells you a plugin is a package of injected code that allows the Cordova web view to render communications. Like, it tells you right there what it does. So, it's not great. Yeah, there, there's the example. 17 lines of JavaScript and broke the internet. Uh, you might not even know some, a lot of, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, when you're building an application, a lot of applications use NPM even if the code base is not even, is not even using like Node.js, for example, you would think NPM, Node.js, but uh, plenty, plenty, plenty of big companies uh, use, use NPM for their packing, package, package managing and build system, uh, even for Android. So another framework is Ionic. Again, uh, HTML5, JavaScript. It's uh, heavy on Node and Angular, and it, and it hops on uh, the Cordova bandwagon using their runtime, using their plugins, uh, but also gives you a, additional APIs. So people are just basically rolling out their own, um, their own frameworks and their own things that make life easier for them to build applications. So here's an example of some, some vulnerabilities within uh, Crosswalk, um, mostly to do with OpenSSL, uh, confidentiality, and uh, encryption. So I would say second most common would be Xamarin. If you know how to write C Sharp, you can write a mobile application with Xamarin. And uh, what it does, it uses uh, what's called Mono, so you can run a C Sharp and .NET kind of framework on a, a Linux platform being Android, um, as well as you know iOS. So. Uh, the interesting thing is that they have their own IDE, they have their own packaging managing, package managing system as well. Um, so they have their own issues, but they just uh, translate C Sharp over to Java and over to uh, Objective-C. So what this example is showing right here is it's uh, demonstrating that uh, by default, ISSL security checks are disabled. And this is straight from their Xamarin website here. Uh, I found a bunch of cool things with, with Xamarin. Uh, they used to, after, this was about last year actually, last year this time, May 19th, uh, they stored their DLL on the SD card where all applications can access um, DLL, the library. And from there you'd pull it, make some modifications, hijack it, and then any type of app, you could hook it, do whatever you want at that point. But just generally, um, not a good idea to save anything in the SD card for Android devices. So I found another cool thing. It's, it's open source, uh, Xamarin, uh, although you have to pay to use their, their backend services. But just going around through their GitHub, 
uh, I found that they have hard-coded their key store password for all the accounts that use Xamarin applications. So it's right here, nice little string of hard-coded password right in GitHub. Anybody can see it. It was reported and it was reported in 2014, and I saw somebody comment uh, last month saying, hey, I think we should look at this again. So, <laughs> so you'll, you'll see, you'll not only see this, uh, you'll see this password uh, for Keystore. So Keystore, you can store certificates, and you could also store passwords. So just think about that. That's pretty important to not have hard-coded for every single app that uses Xamarin, not just one company. This is from their main, their main branch here. So Kendo UI, uh, primarily backend is uh, .NET, ASP, but they also uh, have integrations with JSP and PHP applications. It's more for just migration people to have the ability to use their platform. Uh, and I, when I say they, I'm referring to Teleric. And uh, Teleric is, it's, 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 it's great. They are, uh, again, drag and drop type of uh, builder and uh, they have their own backend as a service. Super, super simple. Click, tells you want to put a drop, you know, want to put uh, a form here, authentication form. How do you want it to validate it? Does your whole access controls. You can create an app in like a week, literally. Upload some images. Uh, really, really simple. And they also have uh, ability to test and deploy your application like right away. And you can also, they have their own kind of VM where uh, you can test uh, the usability of, of your application, Android and iOS, at the same time. Really cool, but obviously, you know, easy and rapid development means there's going to be some issues, and uh, we'll go through those right now. You could just tell by these arrows and everything else that kind of built in that uh, we have a lot to go over. So from, exact, from their uh, documentation page, uh, this is more of a suggestion and guidance for them to how to build secure code, secure applications, what to do in certain scenarios. And uh, what they're recommending to, to people who are, who are developing applications is they're saying keeping the applications out of hackers' hands. And meaning um, to not submit your applications to the App Store or the Play Store, but yet use Telerik's App Manager. Because this provides you with 100% control over who has the ability to install your app. But come on. That is not the case, not at all. There's so much that they're missing as far as, you know, we went through the App Store checks, Google Bouncer checks. Uh, you can have so much vulnerable, I, I guarantee you there is no code review process that they go through to validate that. They don't have the team, they're not Google, they're not Apple. Uh, so this one's basically, if you want to store any secrets, obfuscate your JavaScript, is what they're suggesting to people. Oh, but wait, no, there's more. There's, you can also load your JavaScript remotely but because you can't grab. So they're saying if you're going you're gonna to hold uh, secrets or any type of private keys or anything, just put in JavaScript, obfuscate it, and you'll be good. It's not 100% bulletproof is what they're saying, but it helps. No, it doesn't. It doesn't help at all, actually. And it gives you two, two, um, two apps to do that, Uglify and uh, JS Scrambler. So I got this actually from the Ionic um, forum on how to build secure hybrid applications. And it has, you can't see it here, but there was 83 like thumbs up for it. And I was like, oh, it's awful. <laughs> it's awful because this is the type of stuff that, that happens when um, you know, a provider or somebody that uh, application developers look for or look to for guidance and they're telling them, hey, yeah, do this, do that, and it's all the wrong guidance, all of it from beginning to end. So, uh, Teleric has this is the backend as a service, meaning their, uh, you can use their web server and their SQL server. Um, and they call it data access. So, they give a disclaimer here. Tel Teleric data access does not enforce any security permissions and will, in and will invoke any user supplied data object code in process, regardless of whether it is trusted or not. Tells you, again. It's their disclaimer, we told you so, don't blame it on us, is, is how they're going to point it, they're, how they're going to look at you. So 
So Genexus. Um, I've seen Genexus mostly in overseas apps, whether it be South America or, or UK. Another drag and drop. Um, it's been around a while, maybe I think 2011, 2010, something like that. Uh, all .NET. Uh, actually, no, it has, it has a bunch of different uh, integration uh, platforms that it can, it can use, but uh, they have inherent framework vulnerabilities, uh, which is mostly around uh, OAuth, SSL, uh, the most important things that your apps run off of, authentication, authorization, confidentiality. So that's great. We'll go through those. Uh, again, from their API um, developer documentation, it tells you just same thing as Xamarin does um, for uh, the property that, indi that indicates whether the, the HTTP call will be made over um, HTTPS. Zero if it's, uh, if HTTP will, will be used or one. And obviously it's zero. Uh, where is the zero here? Can't see it, but that's a zero. And uh, that's by default. So again, yeah, they have to have their own CAs, but you generally want to have a big disclaimer of all apps should use uh, SSL, especially when you're transmitting sensitive data or uh, authentication tokens, authorization tokens, whatever it may be. Which is what this is here. Uh, so Genexus, like I said, they use OAuth as their authorization kind of delegate uh, protocol here. And what they're suggesting is uh, over HTTP, uh, send a post request with your client ID and client secret. And also hard code that in your application here as your, your client secret. So in OAuth, uh, how many are familiar with OAuth? A few? Okay, so it's kind of a complicated language as far as uh, the, uh, it's not the language, the protocol, but it's the framework. <laughs> and there's so many different, there, there's so, OAuth 2, yeah. There's two different versions, but um, there's, so client ID and client secret, this is what uh, the authorization server um, will look for to give you actually the real access token or refresh token if you're making that. And uh, obviously when you have these hard coded and they're telling you how to put them in the application and send it over clear text, you can get those and you can ask for refresh tokens. I'm not even, I'm sorry, access tokens because uh, Genexus doesn't even use refresh tokens. They use only access tokens. So once you have the access token, you don't need username, password. You don't need to log in or anything. You just pop it in. And you'll see how, um, I'll show you just a bit how they store it. It's in clear text. So uh, when was the last time you guys logged back into Twitter from your, from your mobile app? Probably not ever because it uses OAuth and it uses refresh tokens. But in this case, it uses uh, access tokens. But uh, we're going to go over a couple common findings. Obviously, SSL is one of the big ones. Um, now, these are just specific things what to look for let's say when you're reverse engineering the app, when you're taking the app apart. This one specifically is for iOS. So uh, once you get into that whole payload directory, get the application binary, pop it into something like Ida or Hopper or Radare or Radar, whatever people call it. Um, all you gotta do is search for these, these APIs. And uh, so general methodology of pen testing mobile app is you get the app um, from the client. Uh, you then take it apart, you re rename it like I said. Uh, pop it into Hopper. I pop it into Hopper. It's free for like 30 minutes or something, an hour. Or you can pay only 90 bucks, so it's great. And uh, from there, you look for any type of client-side uh, vulnerable APIs, uh, vulnerable libraries, frameworks, third-party apps that will call this application. And for iOS, uh, URL schemes, which is uh, I uh, iOS application inter-process communication. Yeah, that was a mouthful, but basically so other apps can talk to um, a specific app. So it's like, uh, I think I have it. It's like FB, for Facebook it would be FB colon four slash four slash message equals hello and name equals Aaron, for example. That'd be a URL scheme. And uh, that's something you'd look for, again, uh, when taking apart an application is, is how those are called. And it's up to the back end uh, to authorize and make sure and validate that 
uh, the client has the permissions to call those. But for SSL, uh, there's, so, there's, there's AF networking libraries, there's CF networking, which is here, and uh, it gives you the ability to accept all uh, certs and also disable SSL pinning, um, as well as allow all invalid certificates. Very easy to find, so this is before you even install the app on, on your iDevice. You're obviously gonna validate afterwards, and that's like the second, second phase, put it that way. Last phase would be like reporting. So Android, same thing. Uh, several, several vulnerabilities uh, with Android. Uh, generally, if you're extending uh, the trust manager and overriding it, uh, you're, you're doing SSL wrong. I always search for these here. Allow all hostname verifier. And allow every, any type of uh, certificate to be used. And from there, you could proxy uh, the communication between uh, the client, meaning the app, and the server. So one thing to know, it does not support a certificate pinning, true certificate pinning. Okay. Yeah, so something to know, again, just uh, Cordova does not support SSL pinning. So if you're a bank app, if you're a medical app, uh, things like that, anything that kind of holds sensitive data or transmits it, you probably don't want to use Cordova. Uh, the next section will be uh, insecure data storage. And this is probably the biggest uh, issue or, or findings that you'll, that you'll locate within um, an application binary. And that will be, uh, like I said earlier, encryption keys, secret keys, private keys, passwords, server passwords, API keys all the time, uh, OAuth tokens, refresh, access tokens, and uh, also what's stored in, in SQLite databases and iOS has something called binary cookies. Um, it's like it serializes a, a file, but there, is, there are free tools out there that will just uh, decode that information and show you, hey, here's the username and password because that stuff is stored in here. For some reason, developers think that, hey, if I serialize an object, I can't deserialize it. Um, cache and temp are also important. Always find vulnerabilities here. Uh, and this is cached within the application's bundle uh, sandbox uh, within that, that document uh, doctory that I showed earlier. And uh, I always find uh, access tokens in there all the time. Access tokens, it'll auto log me in. It'll give me a full URL, username equals, access token equals. You won't be able to see it when you're proxying the app for some reason, but you use that. It pulls it from cache thinking that they're sneaky. And uh, from there, you're always logged in. So here's an example of, um, of an application storing uh, a client secret, client encryption key, client ID, as well as uh, an Android API key for uh, um, notifications, and the sender ID, all in clear text JSON right in the uh, application's uh, directory. So, you know. Don't want to hard code any values, especially for every single app that you're deploying. This is a JSON file, by the way. It's not a plist file, XML file. Uh, this Tools won't find things like this. You'd have to actually physically go onto your iPad or iOS device and, and look at the files that are stored. Uh, it may sound or may look like it's uh, you know, a, a web type of uh, config file or just a, a, re a request or response that's, that's cached, but it's actually a config file with these type of values in there. Very easy to find, not hard at all. This example here is um, an application that many of you might have on your phone now, which um, gives you their Blowfish private key in clear text within the application's uh, directory here. And here is, it's an XML file. It also tells you the database manager and what it uses, core service database. <laughs> so Android, same story. Usually if you test the same app on iOS and Android, they'll have the same issues, more than likely. Uh, so it's easier to go through an Android application and find 
uh, static values and find hard-coded values. Um, just because it's less time and there's a lot of automated tools out there that I'll, I will show you in, in, in the demo. But, uh, which we will jump to right now, actually we're running out of time. But again, same issues, OAuth tokens all over, uh, SQLite, shared preferences is what uh, Android uh, devices have. So that's where you'll see things like this, access tokens in uh, shared preference, clear, clear text. And this, is, this is from uh, the Genexus app where there is no refresh token here. It's just an access token. So you pop that in to your shared preferences right here, access token, you have the same access. Oh, this is a fun app. Um, this is a SQLite database. I was testing to see what data was stored. And they stored username, password, hash password, Windows SID if they're logged in, logged off. Um, they stored emails, subjects, the body of the email from everybody, not just like the person who you're logged in as, but everybody. It almost like cloned their whole database to the device in the SQLite database. So that was interesting. <laughs> Uh, again, just a brief kind of blurb about client IDs and client secrets, but um, you know we talked about that's how you're able to acquire uh, refresh tokens. These are just uh, what OAuth uh, RFCs uh, are suggesting, and it's still the same thing, putting uh, in the post body the client secret, which you can proxy easy, burp or zap. This just happened uh, two weeks ago now. Uh, the, the Samsung Smart Home Smart Things lock, uh, they stored their client ID and client secret. And then again, they had everything they need to get an OAuth token, front access to their house, their garage, whatever it is, just because of that. So I'll, I'll be sending out the, uh, the slide deck so you guys can have a look. And there's references at the bottom and links that you guys can, can check out. Again, another example, client ID, client secret. These are real apps that are in the wild, not vulnerable apps. These are things that I've, I've tested and came across. Another secret token here. Um, sometimes uh, they'll try to rename uh, like a variable or let's say it'll, um, it'll say just a random name like flavor equals, and it'll actually be a string, but sometimes that'll actually be the, the private or secret token uh, to decrypt something uh, before, it, say, it goes into Android's key store keychain or iOS's keychain. So here we go. All right, so the three apps that I am going to demonstrate are Mobile Security Framework, Quark, and Androbugs Framework. And we will start with Quark because it takes the longest. Sorry guys, I just kind of want to walk through this. So it's asking me to provide the APK file here, which I will. You'll see how simple it is to conduct. This is for Android, by the way. So who created this was Tony Trummer and Tashar from LinkedIn. Uh, Tony's now director of security at Tinder. But um, why it takes so long is you can inspect the manifest here, Android manifest, and it shows you. So here's, it's going to decompile. But um, why it takes so long is it's because it uses uh, three different Java decompilers, and it parallelizes them side by side, which is JD Core, uh, ProYoCon, and CFR. And it gives you, it compares the values between all three of them and gives you the best output. So we'll come back to this because it takes a while, like I said. We'll go to Mobile Security Framework. By the way, they're all Python applications. Oh, 
This one runs off of uh, Django, the Django application. Really fast, by the way, you'll see. So right away, it gives you a description of activities, uh, receivers, and providers, the main functions of an Android application. But uh, we'll, also, we'll just jump down. Um, we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, it has uh, the ability to fuzz APIs uh, and also fuzz uh, intents. So it's pretty cool. It's an OVA uh, virtual box image. Uh, I don't have time to, to demo that. But the cool thing about this is it tells you right away like what to look for. Meaning, you know, it gives you the certificate, gives you the permissions here. This one does not have, uh, it, this is an insecure bank uh, application. I will show you a real one in just a second that I found last week, and I'll show you how easy it is to find something. Let's do that now. Let's go to a real app. And, and, and Mobile Security Framework supports Android apps and iOS apps. The only, the only framework that I know that can even test or automate uh, the decompilization of, of iOS apps. So here's a real app. I uh, got a new car recently and I want to check it out. So it's a Subaru, Subaru car. And uh, again, permissions. Here's the Android API that I want to show you guys. And it tells you um, just a general type of services and API endpoints, and hey, maybe you should look at this. It has uh, logging information, logging APIs, and these are potential like passwords or things that are also logged. But we're going to go to the security analysis section. So it, 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 it checks the manifest and, and gives you kind of its opinion on, um, on the issues it's found. But here's where I kind of want to show you, and you know, you have um, where the app can write to an external storage, whether it be SD card or somewhere else. And then the, uh, the encryption it's using for anything within the shared, uh, shared preferences. And you're talking about with the, with the logs, the app logs information, uh, storage sensitive information should never be logged. But I always look here. Files may contain hard-coded sensitive information like passwords, keys, things like that. So the first thing I did was, OK, well, let me go to the beginning. All right, cool. I can get some, you know, a little bit of info. Some tokens, last successful. Okay, you get a, you know, maybe it's running something locally. I don't know. Sure. Then usually I'll just kind of go through the third one, kind of pick random ones here, and then see, hey, is this a config file? What is it? Not too sure yet. Might use WebSockets. Looks like it does. But here's a cool one. Right away, see some interesting values here. Oh, sorry, it's a responsive uh, bootstrap application. So but you can see, again, another case of private keys being stored statically on uh, an application. You can find this within five minutes. It's not hard at all. And you can see how fast it decompiles it. And um, the cool thing is with Mobile Security Framework, you can also check the, the, uh, its Java code. So let's say I want to find password or secret. Cool. Not hard at all, right? So here they are, hard-coded values. Right here, so that's great. I actually didn't know about that till now. <laughs> but um, we'll go back to check on Quark here, because now it's decompiled and now it's going through some checks. And we'll have a look at Android bugs, Python again.
And it's going to want a file, so I'll do dash f. Let me zoom in for you guys. And then still on the Give it the path of the APK. And a lot of checks for uh, Android bugs or SSL checks, uh, any type of secret codes in the manifest, uh, any type of vulnerable APIs for JavaScript, add JavaScript interface where you can uh, basically remote code execution into uh, the mobile device and Java objects, and web view vulnerabilities as well. So this is pretty quick. It's not as long as Quark, which still takes a minute. But we'll give it a second to do its thing. It'll spit out. Uh, a text file, and the text file will have everything you need. So just with it, with with these three tools, you can correlate and actually, you know, have the good portion of your test uh, and know what to look for uh, before even hitting their infrastructure. As far as the uh, the backend API backend, uh, whatever it is, and that's the beauty of of mobile pen testing. You don't have to really wait for the engagement to start or even uh, to research an app. You can just pull it down. Look at the code, look at vulnerable APIs, look at the hard-coded values, and take advantage of that. So we'll go through the text file. Just so you guys can see. If we can get you to see it. All right, you can see that, right? More? All right, text, it checks if debugging is on. In this case, I use a vulnerable app, so debugging is on. Uh, it checks for uh, permissions. And it gives the cool thing, it gives you uh, descriptions, and so does Quark. Uh, mobile security framework does not, so uh, it's mostly based upon your knowledge uh, for the most part, or the developer's knowledge. So uh, Android Manifest content provider, so if it, they export it, um, so you can export uh, activities uh, content providers and uh, broadcast receivers and export means that you're giving an, a third-party application on the device access to your device, your, your function, whether it be content provider activity. So if you're um, exporting a transfer page for a mobile bank, I mean for a bank application, you don't want it to export uh, the exact page of the transfer uh, that's occurring, so as an example. So here's an add JavaScript interface uh, vulnerable API I was talking about. And it gives you the CVE and everything. A little description. Some dynamic code loading. And again, if it's accessing uh, external storage, meaning uh, the SD card. The cool thing, it gives you like the smally uh, snippets. But you can decompile the app, open it up in JD GUI, or use mobile security framework to search through it and get uh, more of pseudo code and see the Java classes. So you can read it like in better English. So the broadcast receiver is exported as well. And again, it gives you a little description here. So let's check back on Quark. Looks like it's still doing its thing. Almost there. But the cool thing with Quark too, uh, not only does it give you a report, but it gives you an attack APK application to uh, exploit the vulnerabilities that, that it's found. Um, so it relies on Android's SDK. Uh, for, for Mac, you could just brew install it. Easier than going through, uh, through the Android site. And uh, install, install on device, and it runs uh, all the exploits for exported activities, exported uh, content providers. And uh, uh, Tony, what, how he created it was just using uh, templates for for Android VMs and emulators, and basically put the values that they found for uh, results of vulnerabilities, and um, put them in and build an APK for it. So I'll wait just a second here, let this finish up. It takes maybe, I think we started this maybe about eight minutes ago, so it takes a bit compared to mobile security framework and uh, Android bugs. But again, a lot of the heavy lifting has been done by looking at client-side code. And then after, once you see vulnerabilities, you want to go ahead and install the app and test dynamically, as well as runtime. 
So um, Tony created this. He was telling me he created this because um, he didn't want to use Drozer. If anybody has pen tested in the mobile space, Drozer is just a malicious application which has really shitty documentation. So he wanted to create one. Uh, see, here we go. We have a, a prompt to create an application. Can I? I can't see it. So I want to create a custom APK. Let's just do that just so you guys can see. It doesn't take very long. And then it's going to spit out a report, uh, HTML uh, report. You can actually configure it to auto set, uh, install on your device too, which is pretty cool if you have ADB. Uh-oh, no report here. Here, we'll just look at an old one. Yeah, we do. So again, it gives you like a little dashboard with some vulnerabilities, things to look at, warnings, um, some other, uh, let's say like web views, for example, web view vulnerabilities. If it works, because of course it doesn't. All right, well, typically you'll have for like web views, let's go back here, because it shows you. This is actually everything that goes into the HTML doc. And it gives you the ADB commands as well. We can't see this. But essentially, they, here is a, a, they ha, he, a, gives you links here uh, where you can test these vulnerabilities and if it's vulnerable to any type of web view or JavaScript injection uh, or JavaScript configuration um, on the mobile, mobile app. So SecBro is, is Tony's. Tony site, but you can just pull these files down and check yourself. Not very hard. But I want to show you guys the ADB commands. Here you go. Change password. Here's a string how to do it. So ADB shell AM is activity manager start dash n. It gives you the command and the string. But if it was working, I would show you how the report would look with. Uh, uh, the suggestions and uh, the exploit code as well as the exploit APK, but having issues on that end. But you guys, you guys can see how how simple it would be just with mobile security framework in itself. Um, again, the cool thing that I like about it is also the the URLs it talks to, and the third parties, and the ad agencies, and whoever else will all show up here as well. And if they, they've taken code from uh, so from Stack Exchange or something, uh, you can see via strings, they give you a strings here and a malware check, which you can turn off. So obviously strings, any type of binary, whether it be mobile or, or thick client, um, is always a good place to look at. Kind of short on time, but does anybody have questions? before I close out, because still a few more slides, but let me just go through those really quick here. So the reason why you want to use these tools, pen test, you usually only have a week to pen test an app, so you want to make be most efficient of your time. And uh, again, you're mostly focused on client-side issues, not web-based or web services that much or API. Obviously, unless they pay for that, but it's usually not the case. Uh, while a security researcher has unlimited time, and they can, everything is fair game. So here are the tools that I use pretty often. Uh, all open source and free. IDB, MobSF is mobile security framework. Secret for runtime and Frida for runtime and Cydia tools for, I, for the devices on, um, I'm sorry, for the, the tools on, um, on your iDevice. Yeah, the Android ones, Quark we went through, Android bugs, lobotomy, goes through runtime and storage API vulnerabilities. And then Speckage runs on the device. And again, MobSF is both Android and iOS. How do you get that? It's cool. It's all static, uh, static uh, code analysis. So if any, of you, if any of you know Jason Haddock, he's a cool guy. He, he has it on his, uh, his GitHub. It is pretty good. <coughs> 
But again, it has a dynamic analysis, um, mob SF does feature. And again, tools don't find everything, trust but verify. There's plenty of things that tools, like I said, I've said plenty of times, uh, that tools don't, don't find, you have to take a look at within, the, within runtime when the application's installed. So here's my Twitter, I'll send out the slides so you guys can have a better look. And uh, any, any questions, you guys can also follow me for my research and things like that. Have time for questions? I think I'm the last one, so I may have time. If anybody has questions? No questions? Okay, cool. Thank you.